Welcome and thank you to everyone for joining us for the Michigan Online Visionary Educators event. My name is Monica. I'm a Partnerships Manager with the Center for Academic Innovation, and I'm excited to be your MC for the day. The Michigan Online Visionary Educators, or MOVE series, is hosted by the Center for Academic Innovation at the University of Michigan. An important part of our mission is to create a more inclusive and global learning community. We believe an informed, peaceful, and equitable society is dependent on learners everywhere adopting a learning lifestyle. This monthly series will feature experts sharing insights, tools, and discussions on issues relevant to the lives of people around the world. Many of the speakers may be familiar to you as the faculty behind some of our most successful and innovative learning experiences available through Michigan Online. For, for information on our upcoming MOVE series, be sure to check out the schedule at online.umich.edu slash move. The Linux Foundation provides a vendor neutral trusted hub that enables open source collaboration across global organizations, developers, and users. Linux welcomes and supports new and seasoned technical professionals to learn, develop, and build sustainable open technology ecosystems. And now a couple of housekeeping items. Today, we invite you to submit questions for our panelists in the Q&A section, and they'll do their best to answer as many as they can. Given our limited time, we ask that you keep your questions related to the topic. Today's event will be recorded and the recording will be made available on Michigan Online. Now to introduce our speakers. Today, I am joined by Dr. Colleen Van Lent, a lecturer at the U of M School of Information. Dr. Van Lent's commitment to facilitating access to programming skills is centered in the various technology-oriented courses that she teaches at the University of Michigan and in her open online series, Web Design for Everybody. Dr. L. O'Brien is a lecturer for the Masters of Applied Data Science online degree program and a research investigator at the University of Michigan School of Information. Dr. O'Brien's research focuses on building data software, and cloud infrastructure to support health organizations. Clyde Seeprasad is the Senior Vice President and General Manager for Training and Certification at the Linux Foundation. The goal of his team is to pro provide high quality training and skills development to the open source community. Hillary Carter is the Vice President of Research at the Linux Foundation, where she supports the development of open source research projects and publications. Before joining the Linux Foundation, she led the Blockchain Research Institute syndicated research program. Jeffrey Sika is the principal developer experience engineer at the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. The Cloud Native Computing Foundation is a Linux Foundation project that was founded in 2015 to help advance container technology and align the tech industry around its evolution. And now at this time, I'll hand it off to my colleague at the U of M Center for Academic Innovation, Ben Anderson. Ben, take it away. Thank you, Monica. Um, welcome and thank you to our panelists and audience uh, for joining uh, this MOVE conversation, shaping open source programming, helping yourself, others, and society. As Monica mentioned, my name is Ben Anderson. I'm also a partnerships manager at the Center for Academic Innovation, and I will serve as the moderator for today's conversation. Uh, so as you uh, have questions, throw them in the chat and I will uh, surface them as um, we hit different uh, topic areas. Throughout this hour, uh, we will discuss the tremendous impact that open source software has, has had and continues to have on our world. Uh, we will also examine how greater representation within STEM fields can further enhance the impact of the work while exploring the role of organizations like the University of Michigan and our uh, guests, uh, the Linux Foundation, in providing more access points to learners and professionals. To kick off the conversation, um, we want to uh, really establish a better understanding of what um, open source is. Our audience of learners spans the spectrums of backgrounds, uh, including those who are just learning about open source to those who've devoted uh, their careers uh, to the field. Um, I would like to open this conversation by asking uh, Dr. L. O'Brien and Jeffrey Sika uh, to kick off this conversation by helping to set the foundation for what open source software is. 
So Al, uh, we are going to start this off by asking you, um, what is open source, uh, open source software and open source programming? Yeah, so I know that there is actually a quite detailed technical definition that is like the formal definition and I'm betting that that Jeff will give you that one but to me I think of open source software as um, free and openly available software um, that usually has you know interesting user communities around it. Um, so you know, for me, my introduction to this world of software was um, as a scientist so I've been in scientific research for more than a decade and. Uh, Basically, so much of science research is conducted using open source software. I don't think modern scientific research is really possible without it, either directly or indirectly. Um, you know, so I, I came in needing ways to analyze data to run simulations. Um, my background was in biomedical work, and so we would often try to model systems in the world, um, and we would need very, you know, serious computing power to do this. Um, and so basically all of the ability to write the code, to analyze data, to do statistics, and to create visualizations to explain it, um, I was always either using open source software languages like Python and R, for example, or tools, open source tools that make high performance computing possible, um, you know, throughout my work. But I'd also just like to say that open source to me is a big, you know, there's a community element too. Um, you know, there, there's a, it's, it, there are communities around different software projects, which means people all over the world are pitching in to create software that they need that helps them advance their businesses, their research, um, you know, just so many things and people really come together. And, um, you know, for me, learning how to program has been truly one of the greatest joys of my life. I think there's no better feeling than making something yourself and having it work and sharing it with others. And and, uh, you know, open source for me is also about finding other people like that and making things together. Thank you so much, Elle. And Jeffrey, uh, pivoting to you, if there's anything you'd like to add to kind of that definition and description of open source, but and also I'd, we'd love to hear a little bit more about the applications of, um, or the impact that open source has made um, on uh, kind of our current world and our future world. Uh, cut me off because I might I might go off. So, uh, L, you did an amazing job describing that. Honestly, in my opinion, there is no hard definition to open source. To me, another way of phrasing it is open collaboration. Open source is the epitome of collaborating with colleagues and people you don't know alike. And that was one of the reasons like I was drawn to it. Uh, you and I also took a uh, very different, in fact, opposite paths. I was a software engineer when I was working at the University of Michigan, and then I got drawn into research because I was able to solve some of the technical problems that a couple faculty didn't have. So, yeah, I open source was just the way to go because all of the tooling that we needed happened to also be open source. Um, but open source is a lot more than just academia it's pretty much our entire lives uh if any of you have a mobile phone there is a 100 percent chance that mobile phone is running on some sort of open source software even like uh Apple applications are often open source. Uh, Android, if you're running an Android phone, the whole thing is running on open source. Uh, and a lot of them are running on the Linux kernel, uh, the Linux kernel, which happens to be one of the largest open source projects in the world. Uh, pretty much it, it has become boring in the sense that everyone everywhere is using the Linux kernel, but it's also really interesting because of how big of an impact it is. Um, now, a little bit closer to my heart is Kubernetes. Uh, you mentioned communities, uh, open source communities. I'm an open source community member for the Kubernetes project. Um, the Kubernetes project is everywhere as well uh, recently. Uh, so a, a good example is if you are going to say Disney World or Universal Studios or really any, any other park that has like a ticketing system, usually when you're scanning your ticket, that ticket is getting uh, sent to some sort of web service that is being hosted by Kubernetes. Um, so it is it is everywhere, uh, both open source and a lot of these projects uh, in ways that you might not know. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Uh, 
we'd love to uh, further explore the applications of um, of open source and uh, consider what does the future of open source uh, look like? What are some of the exciting projects? So Al, back to you, thinking about some of the applications of open source that you've used, you touched on it briefly uh, in your answer. If there's an anecdote that you can share with us uh, to describe some of the uh, research questions that you've solved or continue uh, to pursue. Yeah, um, you know, there's so much. Um, so I kind of came up through biomedical research. And so a lot of what we would do is, you know, we would say, wow, you know, people are complicated. It's very hard to study them, but we can create these detailed mathematical models that, you know, let us explore all of the possible things that could happen inside, you know, a body. And we can make predictions about, you know, disease progression or what treatments might work in that way. And this has been, you know, that, that framework um, is very influential and a lot of, you know, um, bioinformatics where we're going to explore a huge space of possibilities. Um, you know, as data grows, we, we can take more. I always came from a very model-driven approach when I started where we would create mathematical models and then explore all of their behaviors. But now we have so much data that, you know, there are other ways of looking at it too now. Um, so just as data sizes are increasing across pretty much all the sciences, you know, the volume of data that we can collect is, is just drastically changed. Um, you know, we need more tools to manage that. Um, and so, you know, in particular, before joining the University of Michigan, I was working at an open source uh, software you know, company that was uh, making, we did data version control, which was extending something called Git version control to data sets. Um, and I was the co-creator on a project called continuous machine learning, which is about, um, you know, using a, an advanced software practice. It's, it's a great development practice called continuous integration, where you're constantly testing your code and getting feedback um, and helping make that work with larger data sets and machine learning models. Um, so that, that's kind of close to my heart is helping people manage, you know, these really complicated aspects of data science and machine learning, high dimensional models and data. And we kind of need an all hands on deck sort of approach to making tools that, that make that viable. Thank you so much, Al. Um, thinking connected, uh, we had a question from one of our audience members. Um, about the types of uh, research opportunities that are available in the field. Um, the original question was more focused on the university, but really kind of considering um, at large, how is it that um, learners or uh, open source programmers can get involved in the open uh, source community to really explore um, research questions? And this one, either Al or Colleen, feel free to, to jump in. It's all yeah. you, Al. Yeah, sure. Um, so, so for me, so my research is not strictly on open source, right? So I do research and it's enabled by open source. So I think if you're looking for software development itself is the research product. I think you want to be looking around a computer science department or something like the School of Information. Colleen can check this. Um, but there is kind of like what, what Jeffrey noticed is that there's so many researchers that, um, you know, they're, they're scientists but they also need computing support because of so much of modern research is fundamentally, there is an element of software development in basically any lab that uses data. People don't say that a lot, but they are, they are really software companies, um, you know, that, that also produce science. Um, so, you know, if you want to just get involved in applications, that's a good place to start. Any lab that works with data could probably use some of your help. Clyde? You know, I think just to pick up on a thread of what uh, Al said, one of the beauties of open source is the source code is available to all users. And so in the old model, software was a one-way street. It was something that you used and you complained over coffee about why doesn't it do X, Y, and Z. In the open source world, you can go in, write a piece of code to do the thing you would want to do, and send it upstream for potential inclusion in the general package. And so this idea that it is now a two-way street, my wife's an engineering professor, she's not, a, she's not in computer science, but her, she and her students are using models for some of the uh, machine learning, deep learning, and they are beginning to go down this path of contributing. And the beauty of it is you, know, you don't have to write a whole new module, <laughs> one little bit that makes it do something incrementally better uh, open source is a framework where as a user, it doesn't have to be your primary 
function, but you have access, you have the opportunity to, to, to contribute something. Thank you, Clyde. Um, Jeffrey, when we uh, were doing our debrief and prep for this, I, I know that you mentioned uh, getting involved, so we'd love to hear uh, from you as well. Yeah, so getting involved in open source projects is very, very simple, but also really, really complicated because nothing is ever easy. Um, the easy advice is show up. Uh, whenever we are trying to onboard new Kubernetes contributors or uh, contributors to other CNCF projects, the first piece of advice is just be consistent and show up. Uh, that doesn't mean show up every day. That doesn't even mean show up every week. But if you show up, at a meeting once a month, uh, because a lot of these open source uh, projects have like online meetings to kind of align everyone. Uh, just showing up and introducing yourself, reintroducing yourself, people remember that and like contributors will remember you. And then over time, you wind up building, you know, a reputation and rapport with, with everyone. Uh, the biggest thing is honestly showing up and just being consistent. If you're going to show up, show up. If you're going to, you know, do a small thing, do a small thing. Um, one really quick thing uh, that is really related to what Clyde said. Uh, we happened to be in a trip in Dublin and a friend of mine was talking about this architecture and structural engineering uh, issue in Dublin. They wound up putting all of their work into an open source repo. And this isn't even code at this point. This is like architectural diagrams that we're letting people collaborate and, you know, increment on these, you know, engineering issues. And that is just like an another brand new application to the same patterns we're seeing in open source. It's, it's really, really great. transitioning a Actually, little ben, bit can i jump in oh, there just for a second absolutely <laughs> colleen go ahead sorry thanks um i just wanted to chime in because i think that i might be coming from it from a different perspective as some other people where more of an open source user accessibility is really big to me and so we use a lot of open source tools so for our audience members who aren't coders themselves you can still be something called like a beta tester right where you go in and you're using the open source code and maybe you're not you know, coding it yourself, but they're still looking for feedback. So I think of open source as something that I'm not developing myself, but that I'm using and trying to let other people know about, because the more people who use it, the better it's going to be. So maybe you're not coming in from the coding side, but I love how Jeff just mentioned like diagrams or things like that. So maybe you have a specific skill set. You're a super user screen reader or something like that. You can contribute along different paths. Thank you. Uh, so looking at the future of open source and some of the applications, um, Hillary, you have a really interesting background uh, spanning across industries. Um, would, would be really interested to hear some of the uh, interesting and emerging applications of open source. Wow, thanks, Ben. I mean, where to begin? It's all just so incredibly vast and truly fascinating and um, there is such tremendous impact uh, being made across the entire ecosystem along different industries and sometimes it's within industries that you don't even uh, expect to find open source collaboration but I would like to just touch on what Colleen said and what Jeffrey said building on a bit the importance of showing up and um not just as a contributor, but those who use open source software. Um, describing the value that that code creates and from not just a risk management point of view or an operational efficiencies point of view, but from a business value point of view or an ROI point of view is an amazing, amazing contribution and it's actually hard to find. Um, a lot of people who do derive benefit do so from a competitive point of view, and they they it's sort of a a um, competitive advantage for those who are able to to publicly talk about the value that their tooling provides, their software stacks provide is a real gift uh, to the industry, and it helps move the whole implementation and transformation um, effort forward. So plus one to what uh, Colleen said, we need that leadership. In terms of uh, 
applications. I'll, I'll describe a couple of my favorites, one being um, industry collaboration within the motion pictures industry. We have a project community hosted at the Linux Foundation called the Academy Software Foundation, which consists of all the major filmmaking studios, the, the Disney Pixar's, the Warner Brothers, the DreamWorks, um, Netflix, all the big studios who realize that individually, they don't necessarily want to be um, uh, spending all of their effort refining um, tech stocks. There's, there's, there's too much change in uh, the evolution of filmmaking. And so they realize that they're better together, collaborating on common sets of tools that everybody in the industry needs. Tools like color technologies, shadow, um, rendering um, uh, explosions or other types of computer generated effects. And I mean, there's a, there is a software if, for anybody who's an animator who wants a beach scene um, donated from uh, uh, Disney from the movie Moana. But the point is that we have fierce competitors within an industry coming together to create shared value around individual technology projects that they all use and they all need. And, in, and where they're competing is in storytelling. It is in creativity with those stocks. It is in um, making a better film. And so that's you know, one of the best and perhaps most unexpected examples of um, the application of open source software and how it is um, moving an industry forward and democratizing the entire filmmaking industry for filmmakers in regions where they don't wouldn't otherwise have access to these types of technologies. Similarly, in the energy sector, we're seeing um, energy innovators, particularly in Europe with transmission systems and distribution system operators. Uh, there's, a, there's one organization uh, in the Netherlands and they're donating intellectual property. And they're doing so because it's absolutely vital to help uh, digitalize the grid modernize the way that energy data is captured and shared um, to better onboard renewable energy sources and prepare for um, a meeting the, the actual infrastructure changes that are needed to help us uh, reach our climate targets. So there is a technology stack um, uh, that is open source, many, many of them. That's really vital to transforming, um, to meeting climate uh, targets and to um, helping a sector uh, to modernize in a way that's really crucial. So I'm, I'm, the list is so long, I could go on for another 10, 15 minutes, but these kinds of applications are, are incredibly rewarding, um, motivating, and I hope that they um, ignite inspiration for people in other industries to think, how can we collaborate on shared technologies within the industry, create um, value and go compete on other things? Thank you so much, uh, Hillary. So let me, a question just popped up. So before we move into the next. So we, we have a question uh, from uh, Julia as an audience member. Um, Al, I'm not sure if this sits within your realm, but it's I know that it's tangentially related to some of your research. So um, applications in the medical uh, diagnosis area really interest me. I've been looking uh, for, some, uh, for some at MRI studies uh, and they are truly incredible. Do you have any examples that you're able to share or Clyde feel uh, for yeah. you to jump in as well. Yeah, I mean, so there's so much. So basically, everybody who works on MRI data or a similar neuroimaging technology like EEG is another one that's uh, with the brain electrodes. Um, they're generating huge volumes of data, and it takes an enormous amount of processing to do that. And so there's really been a cool movement in the last couple of years towards open science, which means taking the code that you use to process that data and turn it into something that we can create knowledge from um, and putting that online. And there's also like growing interest 
interest in um, actually community standards. So there's kind of an open source community growing around the neuroimaging world to create standards for what should the data always be formatted as so that labs can share. Um, so um, gosh, there's there's a couple of really big neuroimaging conferences that are doing that. I think there's something called like the uh, brain mapping something. Um, if you Google open source, neuroimaging, you will find a couple, I think, of cool conferences where people in the field are taking this on as like one of the most important challenges in the field, how to standardize data collection and sharing. Thank you so much. Uh, Clyde? And it's also true on the analytics side, right? So actually, just this past week, we announced that a major deep learning piece of technology called PyTorch was moving into the Linux Foundation, uh, similarly with TensorFlow. A lot of the tooling and the shared research around the tooling for how to structure and analyze large data sets using machine learning and deep learning is happening in collaborative open source platforms, uh, which is really exciting because you think about things like you know medical data and you know the bigger the pool of data, the more likely you are to find edge cases and you know unusual patterns in that data. And so be you know, in the old world, these would have been in proprietary silos where everybody was sort of trying to hold on to what the potential economic value was. I think what we're seeing more and more as best practices, open source platforms are making it possible to share data, to share analytics uh, for researchers to collaborate in really interesting uh, ways uh, where you know, the, the software is almost is secondary, right? It just, it makes easier things that people want to do for their research uh, and makes it, you know, they spend less time on the technology and more time actually just using that tooling. Thank you, Clyde. And to wrap this uh, section up, Hillary. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing really exciting applications uh, related to uh, health diagnostics that put the patient first and provide the, the consent framework for the patient to share their personal health records for the purpose of contributing to research, providing precisely um, the criteria, the time, uh, the record for which research project, by whom, and um, uh, restoring ownership of those records back to the patient. And projects hosted by the Linux Foundation are underpinning those projects, which give individuals a unique opportunity to control their, their data and potentially monetize their health records if they're contributing to um, a research that uh, where there's a, an eventual market for it. Thank you, and that's it's a great transition into kind of this this talk about the future and imagining what the future is, uh, into a discussion of uh, representation and how to really truly maximize the potential of open source. So as we continue to look uh, toward the immense impact that open source software can have on the future, we know that increasing uh, the diversity of those uh, shaping uh, the technology is essential to unlocking its immense potential. Uh, to further examine this question, we will start by asking Dr. Colleen Van Lent, uh, Clyde Supersad, and Hillary Carter for their insights on why diverse representation in STEM is important to advancing uh, new possibilities in open source software and beyond. So would love to open up uh, by um, letting uh, Dr. Uh, Van Lent uh, start to talk about this. Hi, everyone. Um... So when I think of open source, I think of it like a buffet, a food buffet. And I know that when I was growing up, we only had like potato salad and chicken fingers, like that was it. And then I went off to grad school and there's all these new foods. And I was like, wow, this is really amazing. Like, I wanna try this and I wanna try that. And I wanna try this. And so whenever I think about technology, I think about how great it is to learn about new ideas and new techniques. But I also know that personally, I was also really timid right? Like, I don't want to try this new food. I don't know how it works. And it wasn't until I went out and I started going to grad school and meeting new people that I would meet people who'd like kind of walk me through, oh, you eat this with that. You can do this with that. And, you know, now I feel like we, I can go any place and I can really enjoy like the different ways to look at something. And so like good food, <laughs> open source needs everybody, right? We need people who like spicy food, people like me who eat brownies for breakfast, you know, we need everybody in there. Um, but it can be hard because I think people have a really limited idea of what diverse in STEM is. 
and they tend to think of it along, you know, maybe gender or racial lines. But in my mind, diversity in STEM is really about your own life experiences. Like what tech are you using? What tech are your friends using? Or even more importantly, what tech are your friends and family not using because they just don't seem accessible to them? And so in my mind, the importance of diversity in STEM is not about checking off a box. It's about really looking at like what edge, they're called edge cases, things you don't normally think about. What edge cases are we not thinking about? And I really saw that in grad school when I was using uh, working on robotics for the elderly, right? It tended to be a, a bunch of young 20 somethings making robots. And then all of a sudden I was like, well, wait a second. You know, it's this isn't the intended target. How do we make sure that we're actually creating things? So I really like the phrase, um, nothing for us without us. So if we're designing tech for somebody, we should make sure that the people we're designing it for are part of it. And that's not gonna happen unless we bring them in right at the open source level. Thank you so much, Colleen. Uh, Clyde? Yeah, you know, it, 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 this is not something that's unique to open source, right? I think in any sort of system design, having different users come in and find new possibilities for way in which you might use this technology. Uh, you know, we had a great example uh, over the last few years where a, the group that was working on the software for blockchains and distributed ledgers, which people think of as Bitcoin and tokens, uh, a group that was really working on conflict diamonds in Africa said, well, actually we could use this to solve a really big problem, which is diamonds show up in Antwerp and nobody has any idea where they might've come from. So we just cut them and send them along into, uh, into the general uh, inventory. And so they're now using the uh, blockchain technology to track and keep conflict diamonds out of the supply chain. Uh, similar uses in uh, for agriculture in India, where they're looking at micro weather patterns and how to you know, really calibrate what you should do in terms of fertilizer and long-term weather forecasts and, and you know, when do you uh, irrigate your plants. And so, you know, by getting these different user groups in, uh, sometimes it's finding interesting new uses for the technology as it exists today. And then other times it's actually taking the technology and stretching it into some other areas and uh, trying to make sure that the, the limitations are baked in. I think probably everybody on this call is aware of the early issues around facial recognition and not having proper training uh, data sets going in and, and all sorts of horrible side effects once it was released into, into the wild. And you know, it, it, that, that's an easy example of where if there were more diverse perspectives early on in the development of the project, you know, probably somebody would have raised their hand and said, hmm, actually, what, what data sets are we using to train this? Because yeah, I, I can foresee this being a problem. So it's not just good for the end users in terms of you know, finding tools that they wouldn't otherwise have access to. It's also good for the projects to have different perspectives coming in and earlier is better, right? To really help shape and influence direction in which these functionalities go. Thank you, Clyde. And I'm gonna see if I can uh, massage a question that came in that I think actually relates uh, to this conversation. And uh, Hillary, uh, I'll, I'll see if you, uh, you can take the first, um, uh, first attempt at an answer here. So um, in thinking about monetizing um, monetizing the patient record and what are some of the potential ethical dilemmas and how do we, is there a way to connect that to representation um, as well? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, let me step back to before blockchain and the sort of first era of the internet where data, uh, user data was monetized without any kind of consent and entire business models were built on, on users. And I think the um, groundwork was laid for uh, rethinking how can we be more representative in our innovation and redistribute the value that is created by the people creating that value. And if contributors, I mean, think about contrib contributions to open source. Contributors are, are 
engaged with their time, if they're engaged with um, uh, other types of leadership, just simply showing up, co contributing patient data is simply another, um, another form. And open source technologies provide a type of proof of contribution, uh, verification, trust in that contribution, and where a business model exists around a contribution, then there's a case to be made that it is only fair that the participants share in the value that they themselves create. Uh, so it's specific to the use case, but it does speak to the need to democratize participation in the digital economy. We have digital conglomerates who are who have enjoyed um, uh, you know the windfall from user data. And I think there's a change uh, in consciousness around the world that there are opportunities to participate in the digital economy and 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 receive fair value for that. I'm seeing it in rideshare applications um, that that you know they're indirect competitions to, competition to the two most widely used apps. But if value is being created in a region, um, then the value should theoretically um, and ethically stay in that region. So we're, we're seeing people demand value for their contributions, whether it is in the form of a patient record or if it's in the form of um, usership or any other kind of participation. I think that's where we're going. And I don't think you can unring the bell. Thank you so much, Hillary. I know that was a little bit of a, a complex uh, question um, and you did a great job of tying it in. Um, thank you all for illustrating the uh, importance of representation. Um, there's been a couple of questions in the in the thread about how is it that we gain access uh, to the open source uh, community? So for this next section of uh, questions, we'd really love to dive into how is it, what are, We'd love to dive into what are the barriers and how is it that we can overcome uh, those barriers uh, to entry? So we're gonna we're going to start off by uh, asking uh, L, what are some of the obstacles people uh, face uh, when uh, learning to use open source and programming in general? Yeah, um, so I do teach a lot of first time programmers and I, I have a study right now going where I'm interviewing researchers at the University of Michigan um, who are trying to learn data science and machine learning techniques and for almost all of them that requires them to go through some sort of open source software very frequently. Um, something, you know, often based around Python if they're into deep learning things like PyTorch, which has been discussed. Um, and, and people describe a lot of psychological barriers in addition to the practical ones. There can be a huge deluge of information and it's hard to make sense of it. Um, especially if you just do a Google, it's really hard to know where to start. How to read documentation is actually not that easy for a, a lot of beginners. Um, you know, another thing that I, I think is really challenging for people is that sometimes they really do go seek out somebody to help. Like we have all sorts of experts around, you know, our campus community um, who know a lot about programming. So sometimes people will seek out an expert, but they end up feeling discouraged. They suddenly feel like, oh gosh, now there's this huge, I, I'm now aware of how big the gulf is between me and where that person is. And it can be really hard to get through that. And, you know, so to some degree, you know, there is kind of an art to learning how to be comfortable being a beginner again and again. And I think that's always at the heart of programming. There's a little bit of Zen of you're always going to have to be the beginner. So you've got to be confident, but also very humble. But I also think there is something about a lot of people, you know, like myself who are advocates for open source tools. Um, you know, it can be really hard for us sometimes to communicate to new people in ways that are empathetic, kind, and really, really clear and really helpful. And so I think that that's actually a skill set that the entire, like anybody who works as, you know, kind of a face of open source, you know, um, our community needs to take that on too. How do we be the best possible ambassadors so that people know it's okay to be a beginner here? Thank you, Al. Uh, Jeffrey? Uh, another thing that I just kind of want to tack on to that, um, there is a lot of burnout and imposter syndrome prevalent throughout our communities. So like I, who have been around for what feels like ages, 
I have imposter syndrome all the time and I definitely have to like manage my own burnout. Uh, tacking that on because if you're dealing with someone who happens to be from uh, an open source community, they might be having a bad day or something. So uh, we need to practice empathy being being the folks that are, you know, stewards of open source projects, but also like at times, you know, it's a two-way street. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, Clyde, go ahead. Yeah, I think one of the things that is really unique about the open source community and different from I think what most people's expectations are when they're using technology is how robust the online communities are where I mean there's board after board where you can go ask a newbie question and there's no judgment uh, I think particularly if you're from a community whether that's you know underrepresented for any of the reasons like Colleen was saying earlier uh, the fact that all you are is a handle asking a question uh, provides a, an easier sort of path in to just sort of asking your question. And if you had to be in a room sort of raising your hand, right? I mean, and you know, you can also look before you ask questions and see that, you know, lots of people are asking lots of basic questions, right? There's nothing wrong with you for trying to find out, hey, how do I do this? Uh, and, you know, while it, you know, what, what Jeffrey said is true, right? You know, you might get, you know, for every snarky response you get because somebody's having a bad day, you will get an amazingly detailed, helpful, like 16 step program to walk through that somebody wrote at midnight. Uh, you know, the, the better angels do come out, which is, you know, probably one of the few places where this happens online, but uh, the, the, the active communities online really do provide a fairly soft sort of landing cushion for people who are coming to this new, because they're active and they're, just, they're incredibly helpful. Thank you. And each of these responses has kind of shaped how do how do I enter? Um, in preparation uh, for this conversation, uh, Colleen, uh, you mentioned the importance of recruiting from the start of the pipeline uh, rather than the end. Can you uh, build on that perspective and uh, work to connect it to the conversation? Sure. So how I think about it is the longer I've been a teacher, probably the less effective I've been. Right. The longer you've been doing something, the more second nature it is to you. Right. So um, particularly at places like U of M, I'm going to bash it for a second here. Sorry, but you're like, where you only bring in the best and the brightest. And they are used to only being around other people who understand everything after a single explanation. Right. I think it's important that in any type of educational community, you have we call them instructional assistants here at our university. It's undergrads. It's people who just took that same class last semester, who just wrote that code last week, right? Who still remember the anguish of, I can't believe I spent that long because I forgot a semicolon, right? So I think it's really important that we're offering opportunities to people early in the pipeline. Now, I have to be honest on this, like, it's probably not going to be great pay, right? Because it's, it's not something um, that's intended to be a long term position. But I feel really strongly that if you're going to be doing outreach in learning in an open source, you've got to make sure you're bringing on people who have just done it themselves. Um, because not only will they help others, you'd never learn anything really well until you have to teach it. So if we can bring young not young, sorry, new, new coders on, new developers on, and we can say, hey, for your second assignment or your second project, we'd like you to write the user document for your first one. I think they just always are always bringing in this new sense of wonder. They are also catching us because tech changes all the time. So if you do put a question on a user board, there's a good chance someone's going to answer it wrong because they don't know it's changed like in the past week or the past month. So I'll, I'll just gonna leave with this. It's one of my favorite phrases is we have to stop teaching people to be perfect. And instead we need to teach them how to be brave, right? Don't try to be perfect, try to be brave um, because you learn more from your mistakes than you will ever learn from the things that go well. Um, but that's not, that doesn't make you feel good at two o'clock in the morning. Thank you, Colleen. Uh, Jeffrey? 
So there's this concept, or I guess uh, division that larger companies have started creating, and you're seeing it kind of adopted throughout industry called an open source program office or an OSPO. Uh, that is a group of people that focus solely on the uh, company or the university or whatever the uh, the organization is and its interface into open source software. Um, this was one of the things uh, I was trying to kind of spin up before I left the university was getting University of Michigan to have an OSPO because uh, very much like you said, Colleen, get people in sooner. And also, if there happens to be a group dedicated just to, you know, building on open source technologies, it'll get them both into the communities and be the perfect beginning to a pipeline into their career. Um, so usually I, I look at places that have OSPOs and they are the places that are succeeding because they are, again, that that funnel or that pipeline, e even, you know, both academic, but professionally to get people into, you know, thinking in open source and interacting with open source software. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, and thinking of additional ways to to enter the field, Clyde, I'd, I'd like to uh, pivot uh, to you. So um, in your role, you oversee um, learning for the Linux Foundation. Um, so how can open, accessible education contribute to the development of a more diverse group of future professionals? Yeah, you know, it's something that we've invested a lot of time on and, and we keep iterating and it turns out that uh, you can, in today's world, there's virtually no topic that you couldn't find information about if you went online. The challenge is that if you're a newbie, it is just cognitively overwhelming because you type it in and there's like, you know, 28,000 responses and you can't read it all. And so I think part of what we do, part of what organizations like U of M can do is try to provide, you know, a, you know use the reputation and the authoritativeness to provide entry points that are really accessible, right? We do a lot of courses on edX that are basically, you know, we talk on the team all the time that the purpose of this course is to explain to people, what is it and why should you care? And we're not gonna get into code and we're not gonna get into setting up pipelines. It's just, what is this technology and why do you care? And if the answer is no, move on and go do something else and know that you don't need to be excited about the buzzword. And so I think providing that on-ramp to help people understand, because not everybody cares about everything, right? But uh, what you tend to find in open source is these are largely projects of passion. People find things that they get really excited about that maybe they wouldn't have expected to get excited about, but the only way is for them to learn about it and try and get that first exposure. And so I think a lot of these types of resources, webinars like this, you know, we do a lot of free online courses, to try to provide structured on ramps for people to get some exposure and see if it it clicks that you know that switch in their brain that makes them want to learn more. I think El was talking about this a little bit early on, right? Just sort of happening into open source and realizing, oh, super useful for my research agenda. I'm gonna I'm gonna do more of it. I think mean, providing more entry points, providing more entry points that are uh, zero cost or very low cost. Uh, providing points that are, you know, sync, uh, asynchronous, so people don't have to be on, you know, US East Coast time to be able to access it, you know, really an all of the above strategy to recognize that, you know, the people for whom it was easy probably already found their way there, right? If we're trying to reach those next waves of folks, we have to do it in non-traditional ways and think about issues of access and time zone and language. We haven't talked a lot about language, but there's a huge English bias in most of technology. Uh, I, I was on a call on Friday with a group that's working with uh, Ukrainian veterans. And although the English speak, you know, probably 30% of them speak English, and now we're in the whole cycle of how do we translate the stuff, right? It's just, there's, there's a lot of different angles of attack to try to figure out how to get this information together and make it available to communities that otherwise wouldn't stumble on it. Thank you so much, Clyde. Um, as we wrap up uh, this uh, session, um, I do want to address the, the last two questions in our Q&A. So um, we'll start with uh, Julia's question that came up as we were talking about health uh, fields. And I'm gonna make it a little bit more uh, broad. So um, we know that people have kind of 
uh, different interests uh, in combination with their interest in, in open source. So I don't know which panelists to go to for this, so jump right in. Uh, how would you recommend that someone um, explore a, a specific topic that they're interested in within the open source space? Go ahead, Hillary. Well, I can share my personal experience, and that is uh, to encourage people to write and commit to a frequency of, say, a, a quarterly blog. And writing is an incredibly valuable way to um, learn on your own pace, at your own pace, to also potentially interview um, people from the community and engage them in uh, the creation of your content. Um, or to, to contribute whatever skill sets you can. Clyde was talking about the need for translations. If translation is your thing, then get involved. And simply by way of reading the content and transcribing the content, you're going to uh, improve uh, your skill set. So uh, writing, um, localization, uh, even volunteering to um, do social media posts. Uh, getting involved in any number of non-coding capacities is a great way to um, enter uh, the space. Thank you so much, Hillary. Uh, throughout this conversation, we've really spent a lot of time talking about programming um, as kind of the entry point into um, a career with Linux or a career with uh, any other open source um, uh, provider. Al, when we were preparing for this conversation, uh, you had some advice for, for everyone, all of our learners. Yeah, um, so I think when people think of open source and all things to do you know, with this kind of world of, of tech and software, the first place a lot of people go is like, well, I will contribute by writing code, but that is not always the place that um, help is needed and not always the best place for you and your own skills. Like, so some people um, like me, like I, I love coding, but um, I think my big thing in my career is communicating about coding. Um, and so I've done a lot of like advocacy work and that involves as Hillary, Clyde and Colleen had all said, um, creating videos about how to use things, creating tutorials, creating blogs and all of those things, um, you know, are like ways to show basically what the potential of something is. And then you let, then that frees up other people to try it out. It helps spread the word, um, you know, and that, that brings a lot of value to communities too. So people who can write well, um, you know, technical documentation to keep the documentation up to speed with the latest changes in the code is always, always needed. Things like creating use cases, talking about what you did and making examples that other people could then copy and modify is, is really good. Um, organizing meetups. There's also people that are just big into holding events and just being like that welcoming person that gets everybody in your area together um, to work together. Um, so there, there is a lot more than just programming. Um, and generally in my experience on the job market too, there's a huge unmet need for, for a lot of those people. Um, so if you are you know into both programming and technology, but also communication, um, there's just a, a lot to do. All right. And I think we have time for one, maybe two uh, quick answers. Uh, Colleen, if you'd uh, like to share any recommendations for you that you may have for learners uh, who are interested in getting involved, um, specifically one of our um, one of our listeners is asking is a high school student who's asking for a friend. So, thanks. I was actually just typing that in right now, um, <laughs> and I was going to say there's something called version control, which a lot of people use a lot. Oftentimes, you'll hear it called as Git. That's not the only one, but I think students who like learn how to share their code, um, it, it makes it a little easier for them sometimes. I was actually in a hype up L's upcoming class as well. Um, I'm gonna take it because in college, I went to school in Northern Ireland. When I came back, they said, oh good, you took stats. And I said, yes, yes I did. Um, so I need to relearn stats. Um, and I was hoping someone from Linux could chime in as well, but I would focus on uh, course descriptions on Coursera or edX, whatever, that use the words like on-ramp, beginner, intro, and maybe for now, stay away from the ones that talk about specific jobs you can do 
when you're done. There's a lot of difference between a course that is training you on a specific employable skill and the kind that are just want to expose you to all the different options. And Clyde, maybe this is, you're a perfect person to bring this home as the representative uh, for uh, Linux. <laughs> That's right, no pressure, right? Um, no pressure. I, I would say there are meetup groups everywhere. Uh, and for folks who like the interaction, uh, get online a quick search on your favorite search engine and likely you will find something uh, close to you where, you where you can plug into folks. Um, Definitely Kareem's point about, you know, these repos are out there so you can start exploring tons of good free resources on all the educational platforms. Um, but also there's just, there's so many discussion boards and I, I tell people all the time, just go look, you know, just go check it out and see what people are talking about and, you know, get a sense for uh, what the community is up to, get a little bit of sense of the vocabulary uh, you know, it, 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 it gives you both an appreciation for the technical topic and a little bit for the culture, because there are subtle differences in culture sort of between the different types of projects. But yeah, it's all out there. You know, I think one of the amazing things about open source is everything happens out on the web in public repos. And so you can sort of sneak up on it, right? You can get there, give yourself sort of gradual exposure. You don't need to step out on day one and say, hey, here I am and I have a patch for some code, right? You can really kind of work your way in gradually at a pace that is comfortable for you using the, the learning resources, using the community resources um, to make sure that you feel comfortable uh, with before you decide to sort of ramp up your participation. Thank you so much to our panelists. I'm gonna turn it back over to Monica uh, to wrap everything up. I would also like to thank our panelists. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your stories, insight, and wisdom. And to our participants, thank you all for joining us as well. Thank you to our faculty from U of M School of Information who contribute to the development of valuable open learning opportunities. And a special thanks to our guests from the Linux Foundation who are equally committed to the power of open learning and open source as a driving force for developing accessible STEM learning opportunities. The MOVE series will feature more U of M faculty and industry experts throughout the fall and winter semesters. Check out online.umich.edu slash MOVE for updates and to register. You can also follow Michigan Online and the Linux Foundation on social media platforms. We appreciate you joining us and submitting your questions today. If this topic was interesting to you, I encourage you to explore what Michigan Online and the Linux Foundation training portal have to offer, including the courses listed here, featuring some of the voices you heard from today. These courses will be email, emailed to you along with a recording of this webinar. This takes us to the end of today's MOVE series event, and we thank you again for joining us.